But the main thing I want to point out here is the, uh, the fact that in independent comes up twice. So one of the things that we focused on is try and identify autonomous services, one of the, one of the key points, I guess, in, in microservices. Because they allow for uh, 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 automated, well, easier scaling. So in the operation, if you're autonomous in the operation, it's easier to scale. Um, it's also easier to uh, to handle the development, so multiple teams can can work on multiple things at the same time. And if the, the and if the services are really autonomous, or almost so, then then they should be able to work on a uh, bit of software together. So autonomy. This uh, comes from a um, I think called the Snowman architecture by Roger Sessions. He uh, uh, came up with this uh, this item called autonomous business capabilities, ABCs, which is uh, uh, I guess very, which is a very interesting concept. So we're talking about concepts now. So that's concepts that we're using in identifying uh, our services. Uh, autonomous business capability is uh, one of the key concepts. Uh, besides, uh, next next to the other one, which is the bounded context of domain-driven design. Um, not going to go into the details, because you can read about it yourself. The uh, key point is that uh, Roger Sessions uh, identifies business capabilities, which are uh, which can run by run by themselves. Uh, just two two issues I see with this one is. And you make a business capability that's really autonomous. Uh, to how do you define a business capability? Is it a small thing or a big thing? Um, and that's one of the uh, interesting things that came out of our uh, our exercise, basically our path towards uh, microservices. Is that the size of a service, which is a a discussion topic that you see popping up now and then. Um, Actually, our services are quite large. So that's welcome. Well, you'll see that in code as well. So I think that just keep keep this in mind. Part of the context is also it's a, it's separate, it's a also a concept that we are using uh, to identify services. Uh, anybody not familiar with this concept? No. Okay, then I'll just uh, continue. Okay, so autonomy, autonomy, these are all nice words. So you have uh, business capabilities and they are autonomous. But, uh, I've never seen business capability or a service that's autonomous in the sense that it doesn't communicate at all. So you will still have communication between services, uh, as you will see in the example that we've been trying to, uh, to work with. Um, and you, you probably no notice this, so you've got synchronous calls or uh, Asynchronous calls, and they all have their uh, advantages and drawbacks. Um, and we'll touch upon a couple of these uh, these uh, interactions in in the in the exercise uh, three, I guess that is. Yeah. When we'll be moving from a REST server REST-based uh, integration between services uh, towards more event-driven and asynchronous. So before we uh, actually before we started with the, uh, with uh, the whole exercise of uh, thinking of a, a, a topic that we could then build a monolith for and then break it down into services, we uh, uh, came up with this uh, well, uh, five steps to start breaking up a, a monolith. Uh, so one is to determine your uh, autonomous business capabilities, for which we'll do an, a quick exercise, uh, which will return hopefully a list of, of, uh, of services, or at least candidate services, which you can then map to the existing IT landscape. Obviously two is, is a relevant in case, or probably in all cases, where you have, a, where you have an, IT, an existing IT landscape. So, I suppose that you have an IT landscape with three big systems and you come up with uh, uh, 12 uh, services. Then you'll need to uh, start mapping these services 
on the existing systems. They probably let's let's say that you have one system you can probably divide up into three smaller systems, the microservices. Um, then we, then, then that, that's, that's step two. Then you go, go to step three, which is um, so we've now mapped three services to one big system. So where do you, where do you place the boundaries? Um, this is the, uh, the bounded context uh, concept. But then it needs to be put into action. So you need to, on paper, define where you will put uh, the, the, the boundaries and what that means. So how will then these three uh, smaller systems interact? What is a system? System is, well, application. System, um, piece of software that implements a lot of business functions. Right. In this case, we're talking about big systems that <coughs> we are going to divide up. Yeah. So, so it starts starts with the business. What does it, what does the thing do? What are the actions, the, the business functions that it has? Divide those up. Uh, then look at the three. In this case, in my case, the three ones that you've got left. See how they interact, uh, and then get to point four. Which is look at the exist existing code um, and start moving the data. And look, sorry, look at the code and look at the, the database structures. Um, Boston has a nice bit in, in the visualization part about, about this, uh, where you can see that you've got very convoluted relations, um, which you can hopefully uh, get a bit leaner by uh, by taking out stuff. Um, and uh, if it works, well, sometimes it doesn't work, but sometimes the visualization can help a lot. But we'll, we'll get to that. Uh, we'll give you real insight into the the, the, uh, the component, the bigger, bigger components that this one system consists of. Um, yeah, so four is, um, I think everybody can uh, can sort of visualize the wrong words, uh, sort of what you need to do. So you've got this big bunch of code, you've got this big database, big database with lots of tables. Uh, and we'll need to start separating those out and then identify the interfaces. Um, this is what we did with our example. Um, and you can see in the code then what, what the effect is. Um, normally you don't bring down the, the existing system then build your new services and bring those up. You just start separating out business capabilities one by one. Uh, so this will have an impact. So this will mean you will need to plan very carefully what you'll do first, how this will communicate, when you will bring down uh, what, what scaffolding you will need to build to, to have this running until you've uh, redesigned the rest of the uh, monolith. Uh, you can take the one left down forever. You will have, uh, sorry, uh, so um, there's three, uh, uh, three um, uh, techniques that we will show tonight uh, that you can use to identify uh, the scope of services or the boundaries of services. Um, the first one is, the visual is visualization, where Bastian will uh, I'll show you something. Uh, yep. Okay. I'm here for a little while. Uh, well, let's continue with the slide first. Picture. Well, this is also it's it's more appealing to look at this than on uh, to look at a list or a table or anything, um, uh, because people are are visual in nature. Um, but first, I have uh, two slides to explain actually what, what, why would we want to have visualization of our uh, applications. Um, yeah, well, then we get to the terms of flow coupling and high cohesion, already well known without, uh, outside the context of microservices, like uh, even your average uh, sonar uh, uh, run has uh, numbers on these. Um, so let's recap quickly what, the, uh, what these mean. So uh, when we say low coupling, well, coupling is a, is a measurement of dependency between two components. 
So, and it spe specifically relates to how sensitive a change in one component, um, uh, how, what, how sensitive one component is to changes in other components. So, well, in the extreme, you have no coupling, then it's completely independent, complete autonomy, no relation whatsoever. So, that is the largest amount of flexibility, but, um, well, depending on the application, it uh, might be okay or not. Uh, and in um, the other cases, we, we can achieve for low coupling, so that we don't have a propagation of errors from one component to the other one. Uh, and the worst case, of course, is, uh, is high coupling. Uh, where, yeah, as you can see, they, um, the changes and errors almost always propagate to the other components. Um, related to that is uh, high cohesion. So that's uh, a degree to which the parts of a certain module, module you have defined, uh, uh, if they really belong together and, and, and um, you can have different uh, kinds of, of cohesion. So, yeah, um, we all put stuff in modules, be it Java packages or jars or um, uh, runtime modules or executables, uh, systems, applications. So, um, yeah, we want to find the um, best way to actually put our stuff in these components or modules. So here is uh, taken from Wikipedia, so uh, not my own invention, um, are some levels of cohesion. So at worst you could have coincidental cohesion, you just have a module and you put stuff together <coughs> because it was easy to have one module and, and uh, release it rather than have several uh, uh, independent classes. So uh, this is something you uh, might encounter when you have a utilities package or a commons package and then you look into it and it, the classes don't have anything in common other than that, oh, they are handy to have around. Um, so this is, yeah, the, the worst kind of cohesion because there is absolutely no reason why they would be together and if you change one, then, um, yeah, you have an update and maybe then there's another uh, a class in there that's also updated and you actually don't want that update, so that's creating dependencies where you don't want it. And then there are, yeah, several other uh, uh, ways of uh, cohesion, like logical cohesion, where, where the, the components are the same in nature, they do the same kind of thing, even though they... Um, serve different use cases. Uh, you have temporal cohesion, where you put stuff together that is executed at the same time. Um, yeah, procedural, where they are part of a, a certain execution uh, uh, sequence, uh, or operating on the same data with the informational cohesion. Um, and uh, finally, well, of course, also sequential, which is also a, a time-based uh, cohesion. Um, functional cohesion, um, where the actual components contribute to the single task, and that's actually, the, well, here it also says it's the best cohesion, because uh, this relates to the autonomous business capabilities. If the, um, the components contribute to that capability, then you can, and, and those are put together, then um, yeah, you can really see um, how they relate to each other and, and, and modify them without affecting other uh, capabilities. So now is how could you make this more visible in your uh, systems? And actually, uh, well, these are um, um, the individual components have dependencies on each other. So actually, what you're doing is constructing a, um, a graph of your dependencies and see how they cluster or don't uh, cluster. And, um, well, I'll start up with a really simple example. This is from the um, um, uh, monolith that uh, uh, has been written for the meetup. And this is a, a view of the package dependencies. 
um, the way you can curate it is, for example, by having uh, the Maven dependency plugin, looking at uh, the Maven dependencies, or uh, running jdepend, and it will also create uh, a few of uh, package dependencies. And that XML you can translate into a uh, graph uh, file. And um, uh, the thing is, the, in, in the most trivial graph uh, uh, format is actually a format, a trivial graph format, which is um, a list of nodes and a list of edges, and you can import that into a uh, tool uh, like uh, GED, which can then make it into a nice graph, or you can uh, import it into uh, Neo 4 g to have, uh, to have it in an actual database. Uh, the nice thing is that this, this allows for easy manipulation of the, uh, the graphs. And here, um, yeah, I did some layouting and, and centrality measures on that. So to make it more visible, and here you see the, the three main packages of the, uh, the application, uh, which is the, the microservice architecture package, the domain package, and the repository package. And there you see uh, cohesion not based on function, because all the function um, for the complete domain is in one package. So this is more uh, grouping by nature, like you have the domain objects in one package and the, uh, the stuff that's responsible for putting that in a database in another package. So if you uh, want to change one aspect of your web shop, you'll cover uh, probably all the packages. So you can have any autonomy uh, here. So this is also um, something you'll, you'll very often see with uh, projects using a layered architecture, three-tier architecture. So um, instead you would want to see a grouping on, based on the domain concepts and um, not having these large big blobs uh, in here. So even with a very small uh, system like the uh, uh, microservices um, example uh, monolith, you already see that there are, uh, is some uh, uh, yeah, wrong uh, grouping uh, here. Um, so uh, that's, that's one view. Another uh, very effective view to get more knowledge on the domain is looking at the database and by examining the foreign key constraints. And the nice thing is that you can just get a, 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 a schema dump of the SQL database of the application and, and, and create a view out of that. So you don't even have to have specific tools for uh, different languages. You just grab the, uh, the data available in the database schema. You can, um, get it from the operational database by asking your uh, DBA or um, I did some queries on GitHub to uh, find some nice uh, projects, so I'll show two of them. So to get an overview of the domain, actually the only things you need to have are the, uh, the table name and then what it references and um, in, in many cases, this also directly maps to the Java domain through a hibernate mapping, so it's similar, or to PHP or whatever. I think the uh, example projects I took were one where it was Java and the other was uh, PHP. But, uh, nice thing is it's, it's language independent. Um, so this gives you a quick uh, way to, um, to see these relations. So this could, that could uh, translate into something like this, which is still, because it's, it's, it's a relatively small application still, uh, is not fully cluttered. But you'll see that there are many dependencies and none of the um, capabilities of the system is, is autonomous. Maybe except for this, this is uh, medicine, so that's uh, uh, basically a product catalog for the this is, oh, uh, did I mention this is an um, um, information system for a, for a physician, for a household. Um, so there you immediately also see um, two um, main objects, 
which are not readable here, but I'll uh, through Jet can can enlarge them. Um, uh, this one is well. Could anyone guess what this one would be? Patient. Exactly. <laughs> and this one. Doctor. Yeah. <laughs> right. So. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Bonus yeah. <laughs> yeah. points. So you see, everything is is related to um, to the main uh, the main objects. And the funny thing is that uh, if you look at it from a um, uh, capabilities perspective, this is the aggregation of all the information you have um, about the patient. And the patient itself, well, it's not doing anything, it's just the, the, the subject. So, rather than grouping this together, if you, if you would pull out the capabilities, you would get all this stuff, like this is allergies, and immunization, and uh, stuff about uh, registration, uh, well, there's even something about marathon and religion. Well, it's an Indian system, so probably they have different capabilities necessary <laughs> in their system. So, um, if you look at, um, at the databases, you'll often see uh, a pattern like this, where you have a main object that ties in all the different capabilities of the system. So uh, the thing with our uh, microservices cut up is to actually put all these different roles or aspects of the domain object to, to separate them. Uh, and I'll show you uh, with, with yeah, what, what will happen there. And uh, some other uh, patterns you'll see like here we have the um, allergies is basically a list of possible allergies that are known to the system. So often you see relations and this uh, it based on say code lists. And then there is a question, do you really want that in the database? Is that necessary? Uh, especially for stuff like, I think there is also uh, gender inside here. Well, you have a table with gender with male, female. Then, it's then it is very easy to add gender. Yeah. <laughs> Uh, how, how often do you add a gender? Yeah, well, these, yeah, days, these days it changes. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, I believe, uh, what was it? Uh, uh, Facebook or the other uh, one of the other social now? 15, 15 uh, versions uh, or uh, kinds of gender. Well, even then, <laughs> how often do you do it? Um, um, so, in many cases, that stuff. Uh, Especially if you have the domain logic tied to this data, belongs better as an enum or whatever a property in your code base. And even if not, um, and this is not one with an example, but um, yeah, you also see that there are, um, a, a single code list can be referred to from, from many objects. And especially in the case where the um, developer uh, thought, well, why instead of having all these different code lists, just make one giant one and have an extra column for the actual name of the code list. Then you have all tables tied to into this uh, one code list table. Um, yeah, so even if then, if you have the code list table, just cut it up. If you have your autonomous system, you can have the same code list there. It's not like it's uh, that you do domain logic on it. You just read it and update it once in a while. You do this to get rid of cycles? Hmm? You do that to get rid of cycles? To, well, to, to, to cut up the dependency graph. So here we have foreign key constraints on uh, these uh, tables. And just pull them out. No, if you've got cycles, you get some kind of a, a star or a snowflake. No, it's not even cycles. It's to, to really get rid of the dependencies. So this these uh, doesn't even have to be cyclic. Uh, oh, okay. It's just that that you you you, you cannot. And the, the, um, right here, the database is uh, an an integration point for these different components, and you want to separate. Them. So, um, an example of what you also could get is, is like this. 
dependency help. This is uh, from um, a project called OBM, which is uh, a system for contact management, and it's a huge thing with uh, in written in PHP with all kinds of queries and everything. And you see uh, this turning up if you parse the uh, the database. So this is one giant uh, monolith even though you already can encounter a bit of clustering. So now I'm going to split it up. Uh, let's see if I can uh, do it. Uh, Bastian, your yeah. first, first example with the package structure. Yeah. It's actually a negative example because it doesn't yeah. really didn't tell you anything. Besides mm -hmm. the fact that you had repositories and... What yeah, it shows that, uh, that the... the uh, um, modules were based on uh, uh, cohesion in nature, like group, like put everything about the domain together and put everything about uh, persistence uh, together, rather than looking at the uh, yeah. business capabilities. So you cannot independently uh, develop the uh, business capability. So if you have one team uh, responsible for capability A, like uh, the catalog, uh, and they want to release they have to be in sync with the uh, shopping cart uh, team yeah, because they want to publish this updated version of the same packet so they have to merge it together and if you cut it up differently where you have the packaging based on the capabilities they could release in the packet uh, so let's see so this is the, the uh, database view is just one uh, a view to look at your system, but we found it very effective to quickly uh, uh, get an idea of the domain and, um, and see uh, how the different objects relate and how, how uh, you could cut them up. Oops. Oh, yeah. <laughs> uh, so let's see if I'm. Yeah, okay, so this is the one with the uh, patient again. I'll get to the other one. Uh, yeah, here's the horrible one. So if you... Um, <laughs> it's only a very small domain. Now if you, um, if you open up a trivial graph, so basically the edge list and uh, uh, the tool uh, I'm using here called uh, YED, uh, we'll just put it all in one place. So we're now going to layout. So you could go for a nice uh, orthogonal layout, uh, but it will not. Uh, yeah, that's this multi-monitor thingy that I need to put it back. Now, give me back my. Yeah. So this is really uh, uh, useless. <laughs> so we'll. Um, yeah. The, the only thing this communicates is that it's it's too complex. Hierarchy? No, no, there's not really a hierarchy. No, there is a hierarchy layout. Oh yeah, yeah. Oh, I can try that one too. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Uh, I hate it. Um, give Are me you back. saying you well, really want to? Hmm? No, I'm, I'm definitely not saying that. Uh, uh, this is uh, this is actually the 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 uh, physician system imported into. Uh, to Neo4j. Uh, this is a small domain, so you can just query everything, a match with, uh, for all the edges. The nice thing is that, uh, especially with larger systems, or if you're looking at other perspectives, um, you will really have to filter out stuff to get focus. For example, it's very easy with a, a, a call graph tool to make a graph of all the method implications from, from classes to other classes and even get them uh, uh, to collect them uh, runtime, but then you get such a large list that you, you'll have to filter with a, a nice uh, query language. And Neo4j is excellent for that. Um, yeah, okay, we're, oh, this, is the, this is the hierarchical uh, one. Yeah. So, <laughs> so, so yeah, not not really helpful. But I really like the um, the uh, organic one. Organic. Let's let's go green. Uh, 
Um, buff. Buff. Well, I've done again. <laughs> this is horrible. Well, I'm going to close this one as well. Go away. Go away. Yeah, give me back this one. So this already uh, shows some, some clustering. Here is something that we can cut easily. Uh, so let's add the centrality measures as well. Uh, so now here, th this is one counting the incoming en uh, edges, the incoming dependencies. Uh, so here we have the, the uh, big fat, uh, uh, yeah, <laughs> object that's user, I guess. Uh, let's zoom in a little bit. Then we can start to cut it out. Yeah, we have user here. Oh. Select. Yeah, zoom in, give me, show a dry graph. Give me, give me, give me, give me. Uh, select it here. Hmm? Yeah, the, oh, it's selected. Yay. So, we're going to cut it back. Yay, gone. And then there are two others. Entity, also uh, always a very nice, attractive thingy. You don't know what it is, but it's, yeah, probably some base object or something. Also cut it out. And then the main. Also cut it out. And now we can actually lay out the graph again and see what we all, we are left with. Um, yeah, organic again. Blah, blah, blah. Make it nice. So now we'll see all kinds of fragments left. Still a pretty large one but with where we can have some ideas how we can cut it up. And already some uh, nice collection of smaller systems that are easier to manage. Um, and now the interest, interesting question, of course, is, well, I simply throw away the most important uh, domain objects in the system. Why am I allowed to do so? Well, of course, I'm not allowed to do so in the uh, But the thing is that um, typically only one of your capabilities is responsible for maintaining the state changes in that object. So that would be, you'll not really get rid of it, you'll just move it into its own cluster. Uh, so this was a bit of a shortcut to see if we can uh, uh, cut it up. Uh, so you have one uh, system uh, responsible for maintaining the state of at least that aspect, and the other ones are just reading the data. So there you can say, well, which data are they interested in? Do they serve any domain logic? You know, in, in, in many cases, they're just for presenting the username to the, uh, to the, to the um, user of the system. Um, so there, uh, you don't even have to have referential in, uh, uh, constraints, integrity to the user object. You just want to have the name. So just put it in its own system and have the name. Um, and that will really simplify your system. Because you don't have to worry when changing this system that your um, uh, hibernate mapping still work if there is also a change in the other component. So there's nothing more horrible than, than having this large hibernate uh, 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 mapping that becomes dependent on being all the different domain objects in the So, yeah, we found that this is a, a rather fast technique to get a rough idea uh, of a domain of a system you don't know yet, and to see um, what would be prime targets uh, for cutting up. Because you will end up not just with one user, the user or the, the patient is actually a, a, a uh, uh, composition of all these different aspects the system is, is uh, taking care of, like allergies or appointments or uh, 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 medicine history. And those are all different capabilities you want to capture in different microservices. So you only have a problem if you want to have a full picture of the patient. They'll have to take it out of 
multiple systems. Yeah. And, and what's a full picture? Who is interested in a full picture? Good question. So typically, like the, 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 the secretary is interested in the appointments and not in the LSUs or uh, stuff like that. No. So, and, and, and even then, if you want to have some views on that, you can move that into a reporting system, which is not directly tied in with that asynchronous. So that's the main takeaway here. It's, 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 it's really easy to get <coughs> this overview by just uh, doing the right uh, 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 grab uh, into, uh, into your SQL files and um, having this in your face like ah, this is a horrible mess and how should we cut it up is, is really helpful for yourself, but also to communicate to others. And of course, this is just one example of a, uh, uh, um, a view onto the application, but you can do this also for uh, uh, temporal relations by uh, doing profiling of your application. Or for example, if you already have a, um, a microservices system, you can use your uh, HTTP access logs to see how the different uh, components communicate, what, what the bottlenecks might be and, and just get it into a, a graph database uh, to visualize. Okay, this is one of the uh, techniques that um, can be very helpful, especially if you have an existing system. Uh, uh, another technique is, is called event storming. Uh, this is one that, we, that I think is multiple techniques, so we're just taking a few. It's uh, definitely not an exhaustive list. Uh, but this is one that we, uh, we used ourselves as a, one of the uh, sessions that we had to... Uh, it's actually a real life example of a, unfortunately, a web shop. Uh, uh, but in, yeah, in this case, it was a real web shop. It is a real web shop. Um, and a big one as well. Uh, so we took that as an example. And, uh, maybe not the best, best topic to, to use, but... Yeah. Uh, the advantage is everybody knows about web shops. Uh, and it was very useful because uh, we uh, uh, used uh, the event storming, which is a, a technique where you start by looking at a domain and then identifying all the events that can take place in the domain. Uh, for instance, uh, uh, cart edit or something, or uh, product edit to cart. So that, that, that's one of the example of a domain event. You then take those events, uh, like post-its, uh, and then go uh, at, at, look at the event and see what, what could have triggered the event. So then you get to a command. Could be a user entering something, or could be an external system doing something. Uh, that, leads to a, so that leads to a list of commands. If you then look at the commands, you can say, okay, this command works on a certain bit of data which leads you to a, a first cut for your aggregates. This is by, just, there's no, basically you probably have some documentation, in this case we had a website you could look at. Uh, we use this technique to uh, slowly and with iteration work our way into uh, groupings of, of uh, uh, events, commands and aggregates. And it basically this this is the workshop format that the, uh, the, the author of this technique uh, is showing on his website. Um, and uh, step one to three are really the things you do first. And from there you can then delve and start working with the information that you've uh, gathered on the board. Uh, start grouping it together. It should lead you towards subdomains, pilot contexts. Um, it's also user persona, so whilst you're discussing, you will notice that it's very useful and you start thinking about what the user is, what he wants to do, what he's going to do. So you start building up, uh, I always call them actors. But, yeah. yeah, the very nice thing is that you bring together the people with the domain knowledge, the domain experts together with the people wanting to have more domain knowledge, the developers with development team, so you have people with the answers and people with the questions, 
And well, the, the <coughs> because you are working with domain events and, and uh, uh, everything related to the domain, it's very clear to that um, uh, when you you deviate from from that and delve into technical discussions, and then you'll see the domain people are following it, and then you're oh well, the wrong track. This is this is about modeling the domain. Um, uh, so. From what we found, it was very helpful to get to, to keep that focus there and to have a common language between the uh, the people uh, in the domain and the people who should implement the uh, the system. Um, so this is this is really helpful also for the um, what Eric Evans calls the ubiquitous language you want to establish within your uh, team. Oh. I also found that the, the grouping also it helps in, um, yeah. if you have everything on the board. It's very obvious uh, after a while to see where all the group, what, what groups together and what doesn't. Yeah, and not start out with the groups. So you do, you do not start out with the, uh, with the aggregates or the personas. You just first want to explore what's actually happening in your uh, system and only then look at the aggregates. Uh, so that, that helps you um, to not focus on implementation too early. So it might be that at first you would think, well, we have these and these and these aggregates, but it turns out that that could be mapped differently if you start out with looking at the domain events and the commands uh, uh, first. And, um, yeah, it was. Uh, I really enjoyed uh, uh, these uh, sessions. We also had some at uh, also a medical uh, um, a, a customer who had a medical information system, and and uh, the nice thing is, well, we can all relate a bit to that because we all went to a physician uh, once in our life. Yeah, same for the web shop. Yeah, and it was even if you're completely outside of the domain. Uh, we could still ask questions that were relevant and even uh, turn up new functionality that uh, was not present in the system and had not been thought of by the current uh, developers because they were focused too much on the implementation and, and, and way of uh, it always had been. <laughs> and, uh, and, and for example having a medical dossier rather than looking at do you use event storing for breaking up existing system or do you use it for, for new systems? You could use it for a new system. Yes. That's just uh, that's 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 basically that's what we did as well. We, we had the idea of a web shop, obviously. Yeah. Uh, and no business person to, to help us, so we thought it up ourselves. Uh, by a theory, you could use this for any for a non-existing system as well. Existing system system for an existing system, yeah, we well, existing systems yeah. as well. That's so yeah, we applied it uh, for an existing system as well, and there it turned up new functionality or ways, different ways to look at it, yeah. uh, like have, not not having a medical dossier, but uh, saying, well, that's actually the the emergence of, of of all these different capabilities. So let's view them as different capabilities. Uh, another example is um, uh, a dating site <laughs> also used this approach. Uh, very large dating site in Sweden, actually, I think it's the largest one even. And they they also thought of well, let's re-implement this from scratch. And um, they emerged with a system where there was no such thing as a member of the dating site because. The, the, the concept of member was dispersed into all these capabilities like a person that is looking for profiles or a person that wants to chat to somebody else or a person that wants to uh, sign up for something. So that's, you, you don't have this overall thing like patient or, or member anymore. And that's a, a, a bit of a different way of thinking and by starting out with the uh, domain events that's making it easier to, to break from that traditional thinking. Yeah. But it's important to have the right people in the room. Yeah, exactly. Key so finding is that you need to have business people. Uh, 
Yeah, you, you, you definitely need to have business people there, but also to have the uh, development team there. And uh, so you, 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 you get the right questions and you get answers. And they all talk domain language and not some technical stuff or something else. Yep. Another technique is, uh, is, is, uh, is even simpler. Yeah, a simple iterative process is really um, and it's something you would like to, uh, to have do a quick exercise. So I'll divide up the, the, the group into, I think, four teams, maybe. Um, and, and it's very easy. So they, yeah, I've got a list of functions of a web shop. It's not exhaustive, so you can think of stuff yourself. Uh, you take two functions and you put them together and say, OK, are these two functions related? So if I make a change to this, will this then be impacted? Well, are they synergistic or not? Yeah. That's the property. So, so the property. yeah, maybe exactly. it's good to explain that the scope of this process is different than that from event storming. Event storming is more comprehensive and it actually tries to model. Yeah, so you, you, you make a, a domain model based on events and aggregates and personas and commands and everything. Whereas the simple iterative process is focused only on defining autonomous business capabilities, which is essential if you want to uh, implement microservices uh, as autonomous systems, because uh, as Roger Sesson, Sessions uh, uh, found out, um, the, the, the way you want to achieve autonomy is based on functionality, because that allows for, for real independence. So the, the thing you're looking for in mathematical terms, the equivalence relation is, are these two uh, business functions, these two elementary business functions, synergistic or not? And because it's an equivalence relation, it holds in the same, uh, it holds in both directions. So the, the, the um, is, cap uh, is function A, useful without function B or not. And if it's not useful without B, it's dependent functionally, and it should be together. And then it should also hold the other way around. So, because it's an equivalence relation. Yeah. So, uh, this is actually, yeah, a relatively easy exactly. so method. In the iterative process, you just take yeah. the function, yeah. take another one, and then just start building up your uh, yeah. and you view end up of the with, with a, a, a number of buckets which will represent your uh, ABCs. Yeah, okay, so as, as already mentioned, it's a web shop, so... Uh, <coughs> main functions are more or less this, so what I would like to... do is I'll, I'll, I'll give you yeah, this list yeah, of... Yeah, this is better. I will <laughs> no give you this list, yeah, exactly. I will give you this list of business functions to, to work with. Um, um, and do we have, do we have um, stuff? Ah, right. Yeah, we have things on just that. So maybe we can split up into uh, into four groups, and that takes ten minutes to. Uh, uh, we we can break out into other rooms as well. By the way, well, we don't have to. Like, yeah. So do I need to make groups, or can you do it yourself? <laughs>